Hello, I'm Matthew White, a barrister at St John's Chambers in Bristol. This video covers the calculation of loss of pension in personal injury claims in England and Wales. Here's an index to tell you what's coming and to enable you to skip straight to the part that interests you if you want to. It won't be on the screen for long, so pause the video if you need to. If an individual is injured, they might suffer losses of various different kinds. Any loss of pension is just one kind of loss that needs to be calculated by lawyers and the court. There are two parts to that process. Firstly, you have the assumptions that underpin the calculations. These are vital. How long would the claimant have remained employed but for the accident? Would she have been promoted? When? How far? To what pay? What's the chance that she would have stopped work earlier than intended? What now? Can she reasonably be expected to do other work? Paying what? What promotion prospects? For how long? Gathering the evidence to deal with assumptions like that and chances and so on is the personal injury lawyer's stock in trade. The assumptions vary from case to case and the possibilities are limitless. I'm not saying anything about the assumptions in any given case because you have to deal with them on a case by case basis. The second part of calculating loss of pension is what this video is all about. When you have your assumptions, how do you turn them into a figure of monetary compensation? My plan is to cover all of the most common situations. There are plenty of wrinkles that I'll touch on only briefly, or possibly miss out altogether to keep this within reasonable bounds. You'll get a more detailed explanation from the book A PIBA Guide to Pension Loss Calculation, written by James Rowley QC and me, and published in 2020. My hope is that for all the usual pension loss calculations, what I cover in this video will be enough. But please don't rely on this talk on its own to tell you what you need to know, because I'm going to cut some corners. Now, a lot of practitioners worry about pension loss calculations being complicated or difficult, and certainly I see a lot of mistakes being made. It doesn't have to be like that. The basics are basic. Once you've got your head around them, you're going to find that most calculations are simple. Here are some spoilers. Don't panic if you don't follow these points, I'm going to cover them in the talk. If you do follow them, pat yourself on the back because you're a long way towards being able to do pension loss calculations without any trouble. Spoiler number one. Your pension loss calculation must be inseparably intertwined with your loss of earnings calculation. They can be presented as separate calculations, often you don't need to do that, but they have got to have the same logical foundations. Two. Most claimants these days have pension as a benefit of their job. That means that most claimants have the potential to have suffered a loss of pension if they're injured, and you must consider it in every case. 3. Most claimants' pension is provided as part of a workplace money purchase scheme. That's a scheme where the employee and the employer put money into a pension fund for the claimant. Calculating loss in that most common of situations is super easy. It's also where I see the most common mistakes being made. It's easy because all you need to do is add to the lost net pay that you will have calculated for your loss of earnings calculation. Firstly, the lost employer's contribution to pension, if any. And secondly, the employee's contribution to pension that was deducted to get to your net pay figure in the first place. The common mistake is forgetting to add one or both of those things back to the net pay. Four. Life is undoubtedly more complicated when a claimant has lost some or all of a defined benefit pension. Again, the basics are basic. We're in the business of taking the assumptions as they apply to the loss of earnings claim and translating them into a loss of pension. Finally, spoiler five, there is hardly ever a loss of state pension. That's because if a claimant can keep working, they tend to continue to accrue their state pension. And if they're not working because of injury, that injury is usually such that they're entitled to national insurance credits, which make up for the fact that they're no longer able to make national insurance contributions from work to entitle them to state pension. You'd think I'd be able to give you a great pithy definition of pension probably taken from a statute, maybe one or other of the Pensions Acts. No such luck. Look, the Highways Act doesn't tell us what a highway is. The Protection from Harassment Act doesn't tell us what harassment is. Statutes don't define those things. What were you expecting? Now, we all sort of know what pension is, 
It's money that comes to a person towards or after the end of their working life. Uh, it operates rather differently depending on uh, which type of pension we're talking about. And I'm going to cover the two main types. Firstly, defined benefit pension schemes. Years ago, these were common. The idea was that the employer and the employee would put money aside, either actually or notionally, whilst the employee worked. And when the employee retired from work, money would be paid to the employee. That money paid out, though, wasn't a function of what had been put aside, if anything. Sometimes employers worked on the basis that future generations would cover the pension cost. But rather, it was a function of a formula based on time worked. The older version of this kind of scheme was a final salary scheme. An employee would earn a proportion of their final salary each year worked. A typical scheme might be an 80th scheme, so every year worked would earn an employee 1 80th of their final salary per year for life from retirement. Work for 40 years and you might find you've reached maximum accrual under your scheme rules. You could retire on 40 80ths of your final salary for life. Half pay. Final salary schemes were unaffordable. The private sector generally phased them out and replaced them with money purchase schemes. I'll come to them. The public sector is currently going through the process of replacing unaffordable final salary schemes with what are known as career average schemes or care schemes. The care stands for career average revalued earnings. Now, these work in a similar way to final salary schemes in that each year of work creates a multiple which is applied to a figure to calculate an annual pension from retirement. The figure is no longer the final salary. It's the average salary over career. Each year a proportion of that year's salary is accrued, maybe 1 54th, and every year uh, the whole fund, with whatever has been accrued in the past, is uprated for a measure of inflation over the year, and the proportion of the current year's salary is added to the fund. I didn't pick 1 54th randomly, uh, that's the NHS accrual figure, by way of example. I'll put some other accrual figures on the screen so you can uh, play spot the difference. Uh, here you go. Uh, looking at this table, I find it easiest to look at the uh, fractions column. Uh, and what you can see immediately is that each year rather more is accrued than the traditional 180th that I mentioned in relation to final salary schemes. Now, how does that make pension schemes more affordable? It's a fair question. I'm going to cover the answer to that question later on when I'm looking more closely at defined benefit schemes. The second main type of pension scheme is a money purchase pension scheme. In this type of scheme, either the employer or the worker or both put aside money which is invested whilst the worker works to create a fund which is then available to the worker when they get older. Note some of the language used there. I used worker instead of employee. And that's to signal an important issue. You don't need to be an employee to have a money purchase pension scheme. If you're self-employed and make payments into a pension fund for yourself, that is a money purchase scheme you'd pay into a self-invested personal pension, a SIP, or a personal pension plan where you appoint a company and they handle investments for you and you can pick the funds or determine the level of risk uh, as you wish. Notice that I described a fund being created for the worker when they get older. The rules on taking money out of these funds are complicated, but there are lots of options. You could buy an annuity, pay you a sum every year for life, or draw the whole thing down in cash from age 55, watching out for tax rules, and that's whether you've stopped work or not. You could draw part of it down, or leave the whole thing alone to continue to grow. But you could pass it on to the next generation, or skip a generation and pass it on. None of that complexity really matters to us. Dealing with money purchase schemes is, for us lawyers, relatively easy, and I'll explain as we go. Importantly, I called this a money purchase pension scheme. And notice I didn't call it a defined contribution scheme. Lawyers got into the habit of distinguishing between defined benefit pension schemes and defined contribution schemes. And you can understand that. In a defined benefit scheme, the money that comes out is not defined by the money that went in. Rather, the benefit, what comes out, is fixed by reference to a formula and doesn't turn on how the underlying investment performed. In a defined contribution scheme, what comes out is a function of how what went in performed. Uh, and all that you know for sure is what went in, not how it performed. Uh, to borrow from Tom Lehrer in a phrase probably apposite for the pension savings of many of my colleagues at the bar, a money purchase scheme is like a sewer. What you get out of it depends on what you put into it. I'm calling it a money purchase scheme 
not a defined contribution scheme because whilst it's true that all that is defined in a money purchase scheme is what goes in, not what comes out, there are also defined contributions in defined benefit schemes because those schemes provide for a certain amount to be contributed by both the employer and the employee. Before we move on, here by way of background is a miscellany of things that it's useful to know up front. Firstly, the state pension, which I'll cover in more detail later, is a kind of defined benefit scheme. You pay for it with your national insurance contributions and what you get depends on how many years of national insurance contributions you contribute over a working life. State pension is one way that the state effectively makes you save towards retirement, although it's not huge. A full state pension is £179.58 per week from April 2021, which is £9,370 per year. I'll explain the maths on the screen for any purists. Secondly, in part because the state pension is not huge, and in part because people weren't saving enough for their retirement, the government introduced automatic enrolment onto workplace schemes for those earning more than £10,000 per year, current rate. While it's still possible for employees to opt out, most don't. Minimum compulsory contributions depend a bit on the definition of pensionable pay used, but commonly are currently 3% employer and 5% employee on gross pay between £6,240 and £50,000 per year. That's for the tax year 2020 and 2021. Third thing to mention, I've divided pensions into defined benefit and money purchase. You could also divide pensions into, on the one hand, workplace pensions, and on the other, personal pensions. Your workplace pension might be defined benefit or money purchase. Your personal pension can only be money purchase. It's a simple distinction. The workplace pension is one organised by your employer, whereas a personal pension is one organised by you. Fourthly, as a final aside before I move on, one thing that pension is not. It's not money that an individual has in their mind identified as being for them in their dotage. You might hear someone say that they own a property which they rent out and that's my pension. I'm concerned in this video with pensions where there is at least a minimum level of formality. Some basic principles. Calculating loss is done in a way that PI lawyers will be familiar with from other heads of loss. A lost sum multiplied by a figure to reflect a period of loss. The sum lost is the multiplicand and the period is reflected by a multiplier. The objective in calculating loss of pension is the same as in all other heads of loss. We're trying to provide reasonable monetary compensation, bearing in mind contingencies, both good and bad, to reach a result that is fair to both sides. Now, I can't stress this basic principle enough. How you calculate your loss of pension is inseparably intertwined with how you calculate loss of earnings. So, simple example, if your loss of earnings claim assumes that the claimant will work to age 65, then the pension loss calculation should make that assumption too. Here are some other basic principles. Essentially, normal rules apply. Firstly, compensation is calculated net of tax. Secondly, inflation and income that can be earned on damages is all ignored beyond using the appropriate discount rate, currently minus 0.25% which of course means that money in your hand is unlikely to be invested in reasonably safe investments so as to beat inflation. Rather, lump sum damages will fail to keep pace with inflation by 0.25% per year. More basics, you use the Ogden tables to get your multipliers. You undertake a chance-based assessment. And finally, by way of basics, you have to give credit for benefits accruing as a result of the accident with the usual exceptions. Most significantly for our purposes, an ill health pension paid as a result of an accident, often the case with a defined benefit pension, is not to be deducted from lost earnings. That's by analogy with the insurance exception. Fruits of insurance are the result of a claimant's own financial prudence and can't be appropriated by a tortfeasor to reduce the consequences to the tortfeasor of their wrong. A defined benefits ill health pension has been regarded in a number of cases, starting with Parry and Cleaver, as akin to insurance, and it is not to be deducted from loss of earnings. It is deducted from loss of pension, because after retirement, the individual would have got the part of pension paid as ill health pension and the remainder of lost pension. There are some conceptual difficulties with that, but that is the current state of the law.
So I turned to how to calculate loss of money purchase pension. Here's the big trick. You don't have to calculate loss of money purchase pension separately at all. Certainly, an injured claimant might lose out on money going into the pension fund, but all you need to do is treat it like a current year benefit in kind, and they'll recover the money that would have gone into the scheme. They can put it, from their damages, into a pension scheme. I'll give you an example. Let's suppose that a monthly pay slip shows you figures for pre-accident pay, which you would have expected to carry on uh, like this. I'll put them on the side of the screen. Um, now, notice there that the net pay figure is the gross pay minus the employee pension contribution. That's what EE pension stands for. The employee's national insurance contribution and the tax. I'm going to ignore promotion or pay rises, that sort of thing uh, here um, for simplicity. Now, looking at that pay slip, if that's what we expected to carry on, then assuming the claimant is unable to work and is not paid for a period, your net loss of earnings for the period will be £1,128.79p per month. And the loss of pension? That's easy. Don't think of it as a loss of pension at retirement age. Rather, think of it like this. The true value per month of this employee's work is, to the employee, £1,128.79, the net pay, plus the £52.93 of her gross pay that was knocked off to reach the net, but was put into her pension fund, that's her money, and she didn't get that money put into the pension fund because of the accident, so it's a loss. Also plus the £39.70 that the employer didn't pay into the pension fund, but otherwise would have done. Now, there is a trick to reduce that figure, and I'll come to that in a little while. So what we see here is that the true monthly value of this employment to the claimant is her net pay plus her own deducted contributions to get to that net pay figure, plus the employer contributions that she has also missed out on, subject to the trick that I'll return to. Trick's the wrong word. Mathematical jiggery poker. Accurate accounting. Anyway, our loss to this claimant, assuming that she would have done this work on an ongoing basis and instead is earning nothing, is, I'll put the figures back on the screen, £1,128.79 net per month, plus £52.93 per month, plus £39.70 per month, Total, £1,221.42 per month. You can apply whatever multiplier is necessary uh, to the claim. And hey presto, you've dealt with your loss of earnings and the pension element of the claim in one go. Now, there's one extra wrinkle that we need to iron out. Tax. Saving into a pension fund for your retirement is a good thing. So it's incentivised by the government with tax breaks. I'm not going to set out all the rules on pension taxation, so hopefully you can stay awake, but I do need to cover uh, the most common source of loss associated with tax, which also happens to be the most commonly wrongly claimed element of loss. Employee contributions to pension funds get topped up by the government. There are limits. They're complicated. Skip ahead if you want. In a nutshell, at current rates, that's 2020 and 21, most individuals can contribute up to £40,000 a year to pension and get tax relief at the highest marginal rate on all of it. Or if they've started drawing pension already, they can still contribute but only get tax relief up to £4,000. The big exception is that if an individual earns more than £240,000 per year, they lose £1 of that £40,000 allowance for every £2 they earn over £240,000 down to a minimum allowance of £4,000 per year, which is reached if they earn £312,000 per year or more. These are big figures. It's unusual to need to worry about them simply because it's rare for claimants to earn that much. The tax relief is at highest marginal rate, but you don't need to earn a taxable amount to get the basic rate, currently 20% tax relief. I'll use the typical case as an example. In that typical case, the claimant's highest marginal rate is 20% of tax. 
every 80p that they pay into a pension fund is grossed up by the government to a pound. Suppose the claimant has, like with the example we used earlier, lost £52.93 per month of her own contributions to pension. Call it £600 per year for simplicity. Now that claimant might argue that what she has really lost isn't £600 per year, but £750 per year, because for every 80p she paid into the pension fund, the government topped it up to a pound. So £600 would have been topped up to £750. It's very common to see that claim. Looks like a good claim, right? Wrong. In the example that I've just given, she's going to get her £600 per year as damages. To mitigate her loss of tax relief, all she needs to do is pay that £600 per year into a pension scheme where, guess what, it will attract tax relief at 20%, so she hasn't suffered any loss. Now, some care is needed here. The most that can be paid into a pension fund and get tax relief is 100% of earnings or £2,880 net, £3,600 gross at current rates, whichever is the higher. So if the claimant's not working following an accident, there's no problem with the example that I just gave. She could pay £600 per year into the pension fund from damages and get the tax relief with, admittedly, some administrative hassle, which in the right case, you might argue, would mean that she ought not be expected to pay the money into the pension scheme, so there would be a loss. Even if it's been seven years from accident to trial, so the lost past contributions in our example are £4,200, seven lots of £600, she could pay in 2880 the max, uh, immediately, uh, straight away after trial, then in the next tax year pay in the balance of the past loss and that year's contribution, so again, no loss. But that's not always the case. A claimant might have lost the benefit of higher rate or additional rate tax benefits, which they can't get back after the accident. Or they might, but for the accident, have contributed more than £2,880 into their pension each year, uh, but that is now the most, uh, the, the largest sum on which they can get tax benefit, so they've lost the difference. It's fiddly, but it's worth thinking about. Earlier I mentioned a trick. I called it accurate accounting. Here it is, accurate accounting if you're an astute defendant who wants to save yourself a few quid. Now, Employee contributions to a pension fund receive tax relief, but employer contributions don't. Suppose that the employer would have paid £100 into the pension fund but for the accident. In the example that we were just looking at, I explained how you added the lost employee contributions and the lost employer contributions to the claimant's net pay to get the true net loss. Well. What's the claimant going to do with that money? We've already covered how she can pay the lost employee contribution into a pension fund and get the otherwise lost tax benefit. Why not also pay the lost employer contributions, now paid as damages, into the pension fund to keep the pension pot as it would have been but for the accident? Seems like a reasonable and sensible thing to do. But Whilst those employer contributions would have been just that, employer contributions, not topped up for tax, they're now coming from the individual and are treated as employee contributions, which means that the employee gets the benefit of the tax break. So if she contributes £100 from her damages, being what the employer would, would have contributed, that's worth £125 to her. She's been overcompensated. To avoid that, it would be necessary to compensate her to the tune of £80 for the lost employer contributions, rather than £100, because when that £80 is paid into the pension fund, it's worth £100 to the claimant. I want to mention lost investment opportunity. It's a myth to slay before I move away from money purchase pensions. You can't have damages for the loss of investment opportunity. Market movement is too remote from the tort which led to the injury to the claimant. That means that a claimant who missed out on contributions between accident and trial in a rising market would have done badly. But the claimant who missed out on contributions to the pension fund between accident and trial in a falling market would have done well. Neither need concern us. You'll find experts, by which I mean accountants rather than lawyers, 
who will write reports setting out loss of investment opportunity. I've seen reports written projecting pension loss over a whole career based on assumed market movements. Do not fall for this. I'm aware of no reported case in which the court has accepted that as a proper method of calculating loss. A defined benefit scheme works completely differently from a money purchase scheme and the calculation of loss must be done completely differently. With the money purchase scheme, we effectively treated the lost contributions to the scheme as a lost current year benefit in kind. Add the lost contributions to the damages and the damages can then be invested and the pension will be larger or smaller depending on how the market performs. And there's the key phrase, depending on how the market performs. The significant feature of a defined benefit scheme is that it does not depend on how the market performs. Rather, what the individual gets following retirement is a function of a formula. Now, it winds me up when you open a legal textbook because you want to know what the law is, and rather than telling you what the law is, you have to wade through pages of the history of how the law got to be where it is now. So I feel your pain, but I'm about to do just that. I won't go back too far, but I will start with final salary pension schemes. They were the common pension schemes in the public sector and with large private sector employers for a long time. The formula in a final salary scheme was that after retirement, the pensioner would be paid a proportion of their final salary for every year worked. The proportion varied from scheme to scheme, but 80th schemes were fairly common. In that scheme, if you work for 40 years, you'd retire with 40 80ths or half of your final salary paid to you each year for life. Those schemes became unaffordable. Life expectancy increased and the pension was based on the final salary, which meant that the individual carried the benefit of all promotions and wage inflation across their working life through the whole of their retirement. So final salary schemes are now, realistically, in runoff. Many employers closed the schemes and replaced them with money purchase schemes, so the risk from markets and in relation to life expectancy now fall onto individuals rather than the pension scheme. In the public sector, the final salary schemes were closed to new entrants, uh, but the idea of a defined benefit scheme was not abandoned altogether. The old final salary schemes have been replaced with career average revalued earnings schemes, known as care schemes or career average schemes. Financial products never seem to get easier and the shift from final salary to care schemes is no exception, but there is still a formula to be applied to determine what the annual pension following retirement is. What happens under a care scheme is that the pension has grown incrementally a year at a time, rather than calculated in one go at the end of a career based on the then known number of years worked. So in year one, a proportion, let's say a 54th, using the NHS scheme as an example, of pensionable pay is earmarked. In the next year, 1 54th of pensionable pay is earmarked again and added to the element from year one, but only after it's been uprated for a measure of inflation over the previous 12 months. And the schemes vary on their measure of inflation. It's often linked to the consumer prices index, possibly simply CPI, possibly CPI plus in the NHS scheme, it's CPI plus one and a half percent. Your combined two figures are then uprated again for the following year before being added to 154th of pensionable earnings for year three, and so on. The annually revalued pension grows incrementally over time, pegged essentially to what your earnings were in that year, with prices inflation across the course of your career taken into account. Hold on a minute. Didn't I just say that final salary schemes typically worked on the basis of accrual at 1 80th of final salary per year, and that those schemes became unaffordable? I did. So how can it be that accruing 1 54th per year, a lot more, is affordable? There are a number of things that come together to answer that question. Firstly, what is accrued is a larger proportion of average salary. If one assumes that workers get promoted over their working life, that cheapens things up. Also, the retirement age in care schemes is usually later than it was under the old final salary schemes. In the civil service, for example, it was age 60, and now it's the later of state pension age or 65, and most people now have a state pension age later than 65. Thirdly, contribution rates to the schemes, that is what employees have to pay from salary towards their pension, have sometimes increased. 
Whether or not, even with all those things taken into account, the new care schemes prove to be affordable remains to be seen. Perhaps there will be more changes in the future. As I've said, the schemes all have slightly different formula. They also all have different rates of contributions, and I'm not going to give you all of the detail of that in this talk. It is all in the book, A PIBA Guide to Pension Loss Calculation. For interest, I'm going to show you that table that I showed you in the introduction. It's on page 150 of the book, which simply serves to illustrate the difference across the schemes. A few things to notice here. The Armed Forces scheme you'll see is non-contributory, the only one that the workers are not obliged to pay towards their pension. You'll notice that judges and the civil service accrue at the same fast rate, 1 over 43.1 uh, for each year worked. I'm interested in that. A judge could serve 21 and a half years and retire on half pay, effectively, at state pension age, along with state pension, uh, and with judicial pay progression being relatively flat for most, it wouldn't sh fall far short of half a final salary, I wouldn't have thought. Are we going to see a massive early exodus of civil servants who've twigged that they have accrued a decent pension? No. Not only because their pay progression uh, is not so flat as with judges, but more importantly because of the effect of actuarial reduction, which is something I'm going to come back to. Also, notice the fire service. What's going on there? The English and Welsh firefighters both contribute the same proportions of pay, but the English accrue 1 over 59.7 each year, whilst their Welsh counterparts only accrue 1 over 61.4 each year. Well, what happened? Were the Welsh firefighters' union just not so good at negotiating? As you might expect, all is not as it seems. And to explain why the Welsh firefighters have not been stiffed, as first appears, we're going to need to look at something that has not played a great part in loss of pension calculations and claims in the past, but really will do in future. That is, the effect of retiring before pension age under the scheme. I turn to consider actuarial reduction. All the schemes allow workers to retire before the normal pension age for the scheme, but the schemes are calculated on the basis that you retire at the scheme's normal pension age, usually the same as state pension age, so 67 or 68 for many people. If you were to retire at 60, then you would have accrued less under the scheme because you'd have worked for fewer years. But the scheme was calculated to work on the basis that you only got uh, that part which you accrued up to age 60 from age 67. If you got it for another seven years, the scheme wouldn't be affordable. So to allow for that, if you retire before normal pension age, not only do you accrue less pension, but the pension that you have already accrued is subject to an actuarial reduction factor. These are vital. An example. Suppose someone with a normal pension age of 67 in the civil service alpha scheme. That's their career average scheme. Suppose that person retired at 60. The actuarial reduction factor that would be applied to their accrued pension, that's what they'd accrued up to retiring at age 60, is 0.687. So they would only get 68.7% of the accrued pension rights that they would otherwise have received at age 67. Instead, from age 60, they get 68.7% of what they had already accrued, and none of what they would have accrued between age 60 and 67. How do I know that the figure is 0.687? Because I googled it. All of the public sector schemes, with the exception of the judicial pension scheme, publish their actuarial factors online. The book contains links to take you to all of the actuarial reduction factors. Uh, Google is fine. And the factors are quite precise. They vary on a month by month basis so that if you retire early, uh, you can see exactly what the reduction will be. Remember those firefighters with the Welsh accruing more slowly than the English? What you can't see in this table that we looked at a minute ago is the actuarial reduction factors. Normal pension age is 60 under both schemes, but if a firefighter retires at 55, they get 90.8% of accrued pension under the Welsh scheme, but just 79.3% under the English scheme. No doubt someone somewhere has done some careful calculations on who is likely to retire when. So the combined effect of both the accrual rate and the actuarial reduction factor together is that in Wales, a firefighter accrues pension a little more slowly, but if they retire early, they get a more significant proportion of it.
It's worth mentioning that actuarial reduction factors have existed for a long time. They're not new with the advent of career average schemes. But because the normal retirement age has got later under the career average schemes, it might be that many more people retire before their normal pension age under the scheme and therefore have a reduced pension by reason of the actuarial reduction factor biting. This actuarial reduction factor needs to become a common tool for the personal injury lawyer. We all got used to applying an AUTI discount to pension loss claims. That's a notional reduction in a pension loss claim to allow for the chance that the pension would not have been accrued as it might have been. Many evolved this approach so as to use the reduction factors in tables A to D to the Alton tables as a proxy for the AUTI discount, albeit that the notes to the tables still say, as they always have done, uh, that they're not intended for that purpose. It's now paragraph 58 if you're looking at the 8th edition of the Ogden tables. It might be that on the facts of your case, you need to use an AUTI approximation. But in many cases, that won't be appropriate, and it would be better to allow for an actuarial reduction factor. I am getting ahead of myself slightly here because I want to illustrate the effect of actuarial reduction factors before I've shown you how to do a full calculation. A full calculation is coming, but notice the difference between the following. Suppose a 50-year-old teacher with a normal pension age of 67 and a salary of £50,000. He accrues 1 57th of his salary for each year worked under the teacher's pension scheme, so the accident might be contended to have caused the loss of 17 57ths of his pension from age 67. That's the lost accrual between age 50 and 67. In the hope that this makes it simple, I'm only going to look at those 17 years of lost accrual to play spot the difference between the old AUTI approach and the modern actuarial reduction approach. Claimant might contend for loss calculated as £50,000 is pay times 17 over 57, that's the lost accrual, times 19.53. That's the pension loss multiplier for a 50-year-old man for loss from age 67. Multiplied all through by 0.81 as a table A reduction factor, as a proxy for an AUTI discount. That gets us to £291,237. Have a pause and think about that. It seems realistic and it seems like the sort of claim you see all the time. But... Is it realistic? Our 50-year-old teacher is in secure employment. It's not likely he'll be in and out of employment for the next 17 years. Rather, the most likely reason for him to be out of work for a period, indeed 19% of the remaining period, based on that reduction factor of 0.81 uh, from the Ogden tables, is that he retires early. Again, for simplicity, ignoring the vital question of his motivation to carry on, if we just use the table A reduction factor of 0.81 and apply it to the 17 years that he had to normal pension age, but for injury, we find that he's likely to be working for 13.77 years of it. That is 17 times 0.81. That's a loss of 3.23 years of working life, say three years, three months. If we were to assume that that reflects him stopping work before age 67, then he'd be stopping at age 63 years and nine months. This time, suppose that he retired at that age and run our calculation again. We've got £50,000, his salary, times 13.77 over 57. I'm just looking at the lost accrual here in the hope that it makes life simple. I multiply that by 0.94, which is an actuarial reduction factor under the teacher's scheme for uh, retiring at 65, and then I multiply it by 0.938, which is a further actuarial reduction factor under the scheme to get back from age 65 to age 63 in nine months. I multiply that through by 22.64, being the pension loss multiplier from age 63 and nine months. And what I get is £241,122. That's quite a difference, about £50,000. 
and on the facts of many cases, it will be much more realistic than assuming work to normal pension age, but then knocking off a proportion to allow for the chance that he would not have reached that working age, particularly because the Ogden Table A to D figures don't allow for actuarial reduction at all. Uh, they're just giving information which might influence your thinking as to what proportion of remaining life a person will remain working. In passing, I mentioned that there are also actuarial enhancement factors to think about in a case in which a court can be persuaded that a claimant would but for injury have worked on beyond normal pension age. Now, I have covered a lot, and I think the best way to try to explain and illustrate all of this is with a worked example. I will do that momentarily. First of all, I want to mention deductions. I want to cover two things. Firstly, deduction of ill health annual pension received after an accident, and secondly, deduction of any lump sum received after an accident. I'm using the word deduction, and you can criticise that word. The reality is that there's no loss to the extent that what I'm describing as deductions need to be made. I just find it easier to think of the uh, whole figure less what you need to take off. Um, hence, I call them deductions. I, I recognise that. Uh, you can approach it a different way if you want to. The first of these points I can cover quite quickly. If claimant receives an ill health pension, it must not be deducted from loss of earnings. Rather, the ill health pension is the fruit of past work and pension savings, and it's treated as akin to an insurance policy. As we know, defendants can't claim credit for an insurance payout paid following an accident due to a claimant's financial prudence, because it's not considered right for a defendant to benefit from that financial prudence. Similarly, the claimant's past work led to the existence of this ill health pension and the defendant can't have the benefit of it. Claimants are sometimes, if not always, surprised by this. A horrible mistake made by dabblers in personal injury law is to assume that the loss is uh, income lost less the replacement ill health pension. It is not the loss during ordinary working life is the lost earnings with no accounts taken of the ill health pension. Do not make that mistake. You can think of it in a number of ways, whatever helps you to remember. Ill health pension is akin to insurance and not to be deducted. Or you only deduct like from like, so don't deduct pension income from lost earnings. Or only deduct within the same accounting period, working life or retirement period. Whatever you do, don't deduct the ill health pension from lost earnings. The same isn't such a problem after retirement. From that point, the past service which led to the ill health pension would have been leading to a pension in any event. So the ill health pension is deducted from loss of pension after retirement but for the accident. The second point I wanted to cover under this head of deductions is deduction of lump sums. I'm good at this stuff, but I've long had a mental block on this. I just can't remember the formula. I tell you that in case you're worrying that you're never going to be able to remember all of this. Don't worry, you are definitely not alone. The idea here is that if you commute part of your annual pension, pause there for a moment, commute means exchange. So you're exchanging part of your annual pension for a lump sum. You get a smaller annual figure every year, but a lump sum up front. If anybody knows whether that's etymologically different from when I commute from home to the office, tell me. Maybe I'm exchanging home for the office. I don't know. As I was saying before I so rudely interrupted myself, if you commute part of your annual pension, then you get a lower annual pension every year for life, but you also get a lump sum up front. When you commute an ill health pension, what you've commuted, exchanged, is still a part of the pension for life. Some of what you've given up is given up over the period of your working life, pre-retirement if the accident hadn't happened, and the defendant can't have credit for that for the same reason that the defendant can't have credit for ill health pension paid during the loss of earnings period. But you've also given up part of what would have been paid after retirement, and the defendant can have credit for that. So how do you work out what to give credit for? Mercifully, it is easily done, even though remembering the formula seems to be beyond me. You take the lump sum received early and deduct or give credit for, or say there is no loss, to the tune of a proportion calculated as 
the pension loss multiplier divided by the life multiplier. If you don't know what a multiplier is, you're watching the wrong video. Try cats versus cucumbers or something. Here is the promised example calculation. In the title slide, I called it a modern example because I'm assuming some loss of career average pension rather than simply an old final salary scheme calculation. And I will use the actuarial reduction approach that I explained earlier in this video. The example being used here is the same example as in chapter 15 of the book, A PIBA Guide to Pension Loss Calculation. That way, if you need to look at this in any greater detail, you know where to find it. In our example, we're using a 50-year-old male teacher who's unable to return to work after an accident. If our teacher was able to return to work, whether it's the same work or different, we'd need to factor that into the calculation. If it was the same work, maybe there'd simply be a gap in pension contributions to allow for whatever you have to follow your loss of earnings assumptions, as I've explained. Now, trying to keep this simple, so we have a 50-year-old man who can't work anymore. His current pay level would have been £50,000 per year gross, and normal pension age for him would have been 67. The calculation assumes that but for injury, our teacher would have retired at age 61 rather than age 67. I'm also including a chance that he would have been promoted. We're supposing a 50% chance of promotion to a job paying £10,000 more three years after the accident. The parts of the calculation will be these. In part one, we'll calculate the career average pension but for injury. So that will be made up of the career average pension entitlement already accrued at age 50, the lost accrual from age 50 to 61, that's with a baseline salary of £50,000, but also remembering to allow for the chance of promotion, an extra £10,000 per year, 50% chance from age 53. We will reduce the total career average pension for the early retirement that was expected if the accident hadn't have happened. That's the actuarial reduction, assuming that he would have retired at 61 had he not been injured. To get to our pre-commutation gross pension, we'll calculate survivor's pension, and we'll deduct commutation, if appropriate, at the end. Just notice that the survivor's pension is calculated before the commutation deduction because survivor's pension is uh, always allowed for under these schemes uh, before any commutation is taken into account. Then in part two, we will calculate the career average pension given the injury to deduct. And remember, we will not be deducting ill health pension from loss of earnings. It's only to be deducted from loss of pension in the post-retirement period. The third part will be loss of the commuted lump sum. Uh, we're assuming commutation here for the example, uh, but only giving credit for the proportion of the received lump sum which reflects commutation after the retirement date but for accident. In part four we're going to check for any loss from the old final salary scheme. Most people now are in a career average scheme but the accident might have resulted in loss under the old scheme too in particular in two respects. Firstly, if the accident means that the final salary will be less, and here in our example we need to allow for a 50% uh, chance of promotion. Uh, but also secondly, because the pension age under the final salary schemes tended to be different from the pension age under the career average schemes, and we need to tie that in with our assumptions. In our example, the final salary scheme at normal pension age was 60. So with assumed retirement but for the accident at 61, that's after normal pension age under the old final salary scheme. And it means that we need to apply actuarial enhancement to that part of the pension. And incidentally, uh, the fact that the final salary pension was coming to our teacher at age 60 is part of the reason for thinking that retirement at age 61 but for the accident is realistic. Then in part five, we will pull it all together. We've put tables to guide these calculations online. They're at www.piba.org.uk forward slash pension templates. I've put the collection table on the screen. If the quality is not great, you can just go to the website for a better quality version, which you can also download. So to the example. I'm going to do this by sharing the screen that I'm using so that you can see what I'm doing in Excel. 
OK, so you can see I've got a spreadsheet open here. It is essentially set up in the same way as the tables on the PIBA website that I've directed you to. And you can see that in this first section we're looking at the career average pension but for the accident, assuming commutation. Commutation, anecdotally, is common uh, and one can understand why if you take a lump sum it is tax-free, uh, which is likely to be perceived as better than getting a higher annual pension that you're more likely to have to pay tax on but you need instructions from your client as to their intention. As for what was already accrued, that is a figure of fact that you know by the time that you're doing your calculation. All of these schemes come with good online portals that claimants can log into, perhaps with some assistance, to find how much they had already accrued in the scheme by the time of the accident or at the time at which they stopped contributing to the scheme. So I'm putting in here a figure of £4,750 as an approximation, given when our teacher is likely to have moved from the final salary scheme to the career average scheme. Uh, it will, however, be a matter of fact for you to determine by the time of trial. Next line, accrual from then, that's age 50, to retirement at a balanced assumption age of... We're putting in a balanced assumption age of 61. Those are the assumptions we're making here. So what would he have accrued but for the accident? In this first line, he would have accrued a further 11 years, that's from age 50 to 61, multiplied by 1 over 57, that's the accrual rate in the teacher's pension scheme, multiplied by £50,000, his uh, annual salary. So in this box, I'll put in the formula, uh, equals 11 times 1 over 57, I'm slightly short-cutting that, uh, times £50,000 gives me a figure. Now, in the next line here, I'm going to allow for the chance of his promotion. So that was a uh, period of eight years, because you'll remember we assumed he had a 50% chance of promotion uh, three years after the accident, so that's for uh, eight of those 11 years. Uh, again, we've got 1 over 57 as our accrual rate. And here, the chance was 50% with promotion worth £10,000 per year to him. So you could put in £10,000 times 50%, or uh, I'm going to shortcut that slightly and just put in £5,000, that being a 50% chance of £10,000. There we go. Uh, so I will also put the formula in there equals 8 times 1 over 57 times 5,000 pounds. In fact, let me show you the long hand. 10,000 pounds times 50%. Gets me to an additional chance-based figure uh, of 702. So, if the accident hadn't happened, his total pension uh, would have been £15,101 per year. You'll see that that figure is arrived at simply by adding up what's in these columns, 4750, 9649 and 702. In the next section here, we are going to take account of the fact that uh, had the accident not happened, he would have retired before his normal pension age. That was 67, you'll remember. But our assumption is that but for accident, he would have retired at 61. Now, the teacher's pension scheme is the only one that does it like this. It does it in two bytes, which makes it a bit more complicated. First, you have to apply an actuarial reduction to bring our retiree back to age 65. And then there are further factors to apply before the age of 65. So the first factor to get us to age 65 is 0.94. And then the uh, second factor, for those who are interested, it's 3% per year um, running back to age 65. And then uh, before age 65, this is one that you have to look up in a table, 0.817. So what we have then is an annual pension that would have been £15,101 if he'd have drawn it at age 67, but he's drawing it early, first at age 65, and then taking it back even further to age 61. And so our figure becomes £11,597. And you'll see that what I've done in this formula bar up here to get to that figure is simply C7, that's 15,101, multiplied by those two actuarial reduction factors. 
Now you'll remember that earlier I mentioned that you calculate the survivor's pension before taking account of commutation. That's because a member commutes their own entitlement to pension rather than their survivors. So what we can do here is pop in the survivor's pension under the scheme, which you look up in the scheme rules and find is 37.5% of gross. Uh, so I can put that formula in here, equals D14, which was my pre-commutation gross pension, times 37.5%. I have my survivor's pension, but for the accident. Next I'll deal with commutation. Different schemes have different rules, at least on the face of it, for what maximum commutation is, although often you dig down and discover that it's really the same amount of maximum commutation, just expressed differently, whether as a percentage or a fraction or whatever. This scheme expresses maximum commutation as annual pension times 30 over 7, and every £12 of lump sum that you get costs you £1 from your annual pension. So, our anticipated commuted lump sum here, assuming that the maximum commutation, would be 30 over 7 times by the pre-commutation pension. So that's equals D14, that is our pre-commutation gross pension, times 30 over 7. So the maximum lump sum is 49,702. Divide it by 12, because uh, for every £12 of that £49,000, it costs you £1 of annual pension, which means we're taking off £4,142 from the annual pension. And once we reconcile that, we find that the pre-commutation gross pension, less the sum that has to come off for maximum commutation, leads to an annual pension, uh, but for the accident, from age 61, of £7,455. We've completed part one of our calculation, that is the career average pension, but for the accident, having assumed commutation. Uh, you'll be pleased to see that the second part of the calculation is a lot shorter, and indeed I've added the figures. Uh, and I've done that because these are all ascertainable fact. Uh, I've done the calculation simply because I don't have a uh, pension portal printout to show me the figures, and you'll see that what I've done is I've taken the same £4,750 a pre-commutation gross pension. The survivor's pension is 37.5% of it. Uh, I've assumed maximum commutation, again using the formula 30 over 7 and applying it to the gross pension before commutation. Divide that by 12 to see the cost from the annual pension, which gets me to a total gross annual pension on actual retirement of £3,054. Now here I'm assuming that our teacher has taken ill health retirement, uh, on a tier one basis under the teacher's scheme, which means that he doesn't have to give credit for an actuarial reduction for having drawn his pension early. Uh, so that's the sum for which uh, we need to give credit, £3,054. We can move on and calculate the lost commuted lump sum. Uh, you'll see that I have put in here the lost lump sum on the assumed career, that's to age 61, at 49,702. I've taken that from up there where it was calculated. Uh, less the lump sum received. I calculated that a moment ago, although as I've said, it will be a matter of fact for you to ascertain from the claimant's documents. The deductible proportion, that is pension multiplier over life multiplier, the difficult to remember for me formula. Uh, take my word for it for the time being. The pension loss multiplier is 25.32 and the life multiplier is 36.24. I will explain how to get those figures later on in this video when I deal with the question of multipliers. So the sum to deduct is the lump sum received, that is B34, multiplied by our proportion, so times 25.32 over 36.24. The sum to deduct is 14,223, and here it is calculated for me. That's 49,702 minus 14,223. Uh, there is my uh, loss of lump sum uh, as of the retirement date had the accident not happened, and I will take account of accelerated receipt shortly. I'm moving on to the part that it's easy to forget, but is definitely uh, worth not forgetting. That is the final salary components that have been lost based on the assumptions from the lost career. So we assumed, you'll remember, a 50% chance of a £10,000 pay rise uh, 
in three years time. So if I fill in the blanks here, we're talking about a difference of £10,000 with a 50% chance and that would run over 22 years because that's the duration of time that he served in the final salary pension scheme. Again, I've made up that figure. It's going to be about right. It's illustrative. You will know how long he served in the final salary scheme because you can find that out from the online portal. And in this final salary scheme, accrual was at a rate of 1 over 80. So we can see that the difference is £10,000, 50% chance, 22 years, at 180th per year. So I will put that in here as £10,000 times a 50% chance times 22 years in an 80th scheme. So that figure shows us the annual loss from retirement uh, because of the lost promotion uh, chance. Moving on, we need to deal with the loss to the whole of the final salary pension scheme uh, on the basis that he would have retired at age 61 rather than 60, and 60 was normal pension age under that scheme. So we have our baseline final salary pension, that's without the chance of promotion, £50,000, and again we've got the same 22 years in the scheme, and Let's move my mouse out of the way and again it's an 80th scheme so in this box uh, we need to add our formula equals fifty thousand pounds times 22 years in an 80th scheme so that is the baseline salary if he hadn't been promoted from the final salary scheme adding that to the additional chance of him being promoted, we see that his final salary pension per year, allowing for the lost promotion prospects, was £15,125. We need to add the actuarial enhancement, and it's, oops, it's for deferring from, in our case, uh, age 60, to age 61, so a one year delay. And again, you look this up in a table, take my word for it for now, 0.048 is the enhancement factor for that year of delay. So the total lost actuarial uplift is £726. Therefore, the total lost final salary pension components are the £1,375 chance of promotion valued and the £726 actuarial uplift because he would have delayed the whole lot by a year. We also, under the final salary scheme, have a lost automatic lump sum. Now we've talked about commuting part of your annual pension to get a lump sum. In some of the schemes, this being one of them, you got an automatic lump sum in addition to your annual pension. So what we are going to do uh, here is calculate simply three times the annual loss occasioned by the accident. Which gets me to, oops, equal to C47 times three, I should have said, I forgot the three. There we go, so £6,303 uh, as a lost automatic sum and an annual loss of £2,101. We also need to take account of the reduction in survivor's pension. Under the final salary scheme, the uh, partners got one 160th of the pension. They effectively got half pension instead of 180. Uh, so we are talking about one half of the annual pension. And that's the 2000, oh, I'll pop it in here so you can see exactly what I'm doing, to 101. So that is C47 over 2, half of the annual pension. So the survivor's loss, because of this accident bringing an end to the career early, is an annual pension loss of £1,051.
we come at last to the collection table at the bottom here where we collect our components together. Now you'll see that all of the figures have already gone in. I'm going to show you how uh, that worked out, uh, but I'm going to split my screen. You don't need to be here for that. Okay, so I've split the screen in this spreadsheet so the collection table appears at the bottom and everything else I will be scrolling through above it, but the collection table will stay on the screen all the time so you can see what's going on. There's a column here to make up state pension. That's to fill in if it's necessary to make national insurance contributions to buy back years of missed state pension. Uh, I'm assuming that our teacher doesn't need to do that. Rather, he's entitled to some sort of benefit that gives him national insurance credits. So I'll simply put in a zero there and a zero in the subtotal. Uh, not, not applicable for the early recovery factor and zero. Next column, more interesting. This is where we have the uh, lump sum. We have assumed retirement age, and you'll remember it was 61. Uh, and I've got two figures in here. Firstly, we've got the lost lump sum under the care scheme. That is, if he'd have kept working for those extra years, he'd have acquired a bigger lump sum. That figure, I've labelled it as D, comes from our overall calculation uh, in the lost lump sum section. There it is. We worked out the lump sum loss at retirement date, 61 at £35,000 odd. It's in cell E37, and so this collection table has picked up E37. The next line is the lost lump sum under the final salary scheme. Again, you'll remember that uh, there were components of the final salary scheme uh, that meant that his lump sum would be smaller. Uh, both because of the lost chance of promotion and the uh, actuarial enhancement because of one year uh, delay in retirement after normal pension age. So there we arrived at a figure in box C48 uh, of 6,303 and that is carried down into our collection table in uh, the box there. Totaling here, the subtotal of the lost lump sums, I'll use the auto sum feature, £41,782. The factor for early recovery, uh, he's having that money accounted for early, so I will look up a factor in table 35, uh, and I'll pop that in there so you can see what I'm doing. A slightly positive accelerated receipt factor because the discount rate is currently a slight negative, and the calculation becomes equals C62 times 1.0279. I'm not worrying there about the difference uh, between date of injury and date of trial. In our next column, claimant's pension for life. Struggling slightly to keep this whole uh, box on the screen, I keep overshooting slightly. Here we have a series of figures for the claimant and the survivor, the career pension that he would have got and she would have got, the uh, care pension now payable for claimant and survivor, uh, the gross final salary lost income and the gross losses. We're going to quickly look through all of them just to remind you where all these figures came from. But really all I'm doing here is bringing down figures from above. So if the accident hadn't happened, what would claimant's gross career average pension have been. You will remember the first thing we looked at in section one of our calculation here. Uh, we worked through it line by line, care, pension, but for accident. We assumed commutation. And we got to a figure of £7,455 in box E21, and there it is uh, down in our collection table. The survivor's pension we calculated before we did the commutation. There it is, and you'll see again that appears down in the collection table. So, but for the accidents, the total care pension that would have accrued. I've edited out here showing you how to bring all these numbers down. It's pretty obvious if you go back and watch through the video. So, we have gross losses, and I'll just show you the formula for this. D57, so that's that figure, minus. D58, because 
what we're doing is subtracting the care pension that he will be entitled to in any event, plus D59 being the lost final salary element. Same thing for the survivor. In this less tax box, I'm going to adopt a simple approach for illustration purposes. And I'm going to assume that the other sources of pension, rather than what has been lost, would have used up all of the claimant's uh, tax-free allowance, such that all of this loss would be taxable at 20%. So I'm going to say 0.8 to allow for 20% tax on all of this loss. In claims involving larger or smaller pensions, you might need to adjust that for either no tax or high level tax. It's relatively unusual to need to do that. So if I multiply our gross loss figure, that here is D60 times 0.8 for tax, I get to a net figure. I don't want the decimal places, so I will take them away in the box. Take away the decimals. And I'll just copy that across to the survivor as well, so that we can see what the net loss for the survivor is. Again, we've assumed that the survivor uh, will uh, be paying tax on other pensions, such that this loss is all taxable at 20%. We now need to apply our multipliers, and uh, for the time being, take my word for it, that the pension loss multiplier from age 61 is 25.32 and that the survivorship multiplier is times 6.28. I will explain how to get to those figures when I deal with multipliers a little later on. So finally, we get to work out the net loss. So that's D62 multiplied through by our pension loss multiplier. gets me to a total pension loss for the claimant of £131,000 odd. And similarly, if I deal with the survivor's loss, using the survivorship multiplier, I get to £18,000 odd. And then all I've done here is total up all of those losses. So tax has been taken account of, lost lump sum has been taken account of, loss of career average pension has been taken account of, loss of final salary pension has been taken account of. It's all there. We needed to go through it line by line, but having done that, we've got a figure that we can rely on. A little bit about state pension. Now, I heralded this in the spoilers section at the top of the show. There is hardly ever a loss of state pension. The state pension is a kind of defined benefit scheme. You work and you pay national insurance contributions, and at the end of your working life, you get a state pension from state pension age. The current version of the state pension requires 35 years of national insurance contributions, and th then you get 35 35ths of the state pension. The key point is that if you work and pay national insurance contributions, you get credits towards state pension. Each year worked counts 1 35th. If you can't work and you get benefits of the kind that people who can't work because of injury get, you get national insurance credits, which means that it is very unusual to see a loss of state pension. The class of claimant who might suffer a loss of state pension is the kind who is no longer working because of injury, but who doesn't qualify for benefits. They might sustain a loss if they haven't managed to accrue 35 years of work towards their state pension. But it would be a mistake to think that if they lose 10 years of working life, they lose 10 35ths of their state pension. Uh, it is a mistake to say full st state pension times 10 over 35 times the pension loss multiplier from retirement age. Rather, what you need to do is check how many years they had to go before they got the full state pension. And it's easy to get a state pension forecast online. Then you need to think about what it costs to buy back 
contributions to the state pension by paying voluntary national insurance contributions, currently £15.30p per week, that's 2020, 2021 rates, probably going up by 10p a week in the next financial year. So for about £800 per year, you can buy back any lost state pension. That is far smaller by way of loss than multiplying your lost accrual through by the full state pension from state pension age. I've already explained why you should not be tempted to use an accountant or a similar expert to calculate loss in a money purchase pension situation. There's no need to use an expert to calculate loss of pension in most defined benefit situations either. A lawyer can and should do it following the principles I've been talking about and using the book. Obviously there's a question of efficiency to bear in mind. An expert might be more efficient but query whether or not you'll recover the costs. Better, I would suggest, to use a specialist member of the personal injury bar to do the calculations. I can see a case for instructing experts in large pension loss cases, and the one area that requires particular mention is the lifetime allowance. I promise not to get bogged down in tax issues, but highly paid employees do need to worry about the lifetime allowance. You'll remember that I described tax breaks to incentivise pension savings. The government wants to incentivise, but not too much incentive. It doesn't want people sheltering too much from tax. So there's a limit on pension fund value before an additional tax is charged. It's currently over a million pounds, so it really does only affect higher earners. It's easy to see whether or not a money purchase scheme would breach the allowance because the value of that scheme is simply the value of the pension pot. For defined benefit schemes, you can work on the basis of 20 times the annual pension as the pot value. So with current lifetime allowance limits, the claimant would need to be in line for about £53,655 per year in a defined benefit pension before triggering it. The tax, if it's payable, is heavy and it's best avoided where possible. So I can see a case to be made in those larger value cases for an expert to cover that. I used to hate calculating split multipliers using the method in the seventh edition of the Ogden tables and earlier editions. But the additional tables that have come out with the eighth edition of the Ogden tables has made this so much easier. It takes a little bit of time to get used to how to do it but it is straightforward and I will show you how. I'll go relatively quickly because you can always pause the video uh, or rewind to have another look. I have here on my screen a copy of the additional tables that come with the Ogden tables. Uh, you can find these very easily by googling Ogden tables 8th edition additional tables and you will get yourself a copy like this. First thing I always do uh, is to get rid of the minus 0.75% uh, discount rates tables. I will never need those because I don't litigate in Scotland, so they can go. Uh, that leaves me with the 0% tables and the minus 0.25% tables. I will just show you briefly what the point of the 0% tables is for anybody who's interested. Uh, let me just show you around briefly. Age at date of trial, and we have across the top here uh, the multipliers to a given period. So if we keep scrolling across to the left, you'll see a triangular shape. So a one-year-old chance of um, a multiplier to age two, one, multiplier to age three, two, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, the significance of the 0% tables is that if we go right across to the right, I'll just pick a 30-year-old man by way of example. I'll highlight the row so that you can see what I'm talking about. If I go right across to the far side of the table, uh, the multiplier uh, for that person to age 125 is said to be 55.46, but you'll notice it's the same every year for years um, up to this final column, and that's because that is the full life uh, multiplier at a 0% discount rate. If you need a life expectancy rather than a life multiplier, you can use this table, the 0% discount rate table. I'm not particularly interested in that today, so I am going to go out of uh, males and females 0% and into males and females minus 0.25% to find out multipliers. You'll see that the age at date of trial is always given as a whole number. That is uh, very rarely exactly what you need. You usually need something that falls between two numbers. I will show you how to do that. It is easy. 
Imagine a female claimant born on the 1st of January 1970 uh, with a calculation or a trial date of the 10th of September 2022. Uh, we've picked someone who is 52 years, 9 months and 9 days old. So her age would fall between age 52 and 53. So what I will do is pop in a blank line between 52 and 53. Google it if you don't know how to do that. Uh, and I will say that is 52 years plus 9 months, 9 over 12, plus 9 days, 9 over 365, which is good enough for these purposes. That gives me a uh, accurate digital uh, decimal rather age of 52.77466. I don't want that many uh, decimal places, so I'm going to get rid of uh, everything to bring it down to 52.77. If we go across the table, we discover that whilst we've got multipliers for uh, age 52 and age 53, we've just got a whole line of blanks for someone who's 52.77, uh, and we need to fill those blanks in. We need, in this box that I've highlighted here, which you'll see is the first uh, box where there is a multiplier on either side of it, we need to go 77% of the way, notice the decimal, from the multiplier for 52 to the multiplier for 53. So what we're going to do is start with our larger multiplier and take off 77% of the difference, which means that in that cell we are going to add the formula equals the cell code for the greater multiplier, which here is BC58, minus, remembering to open some brackets uh, so that the formula works out, the cell code for the greater again, BC58, oops, 58, minus the cell code for the smaller multiplier, BC60, and we only want 77% of the difference, so I'm multiplying that through by 0 0.77. It then calculates for me a multiplier of 1.23. Now, I would expect that multiplier to be closer to 1 than to 2, because I'm supposed to have gone 77% of the way towards 53, and hey presto, I find that I have achieved my objective. And the big trick is, I will use Control c to copy that multiplier, I'm going to pop it in all of these cells, all the way across uh, to the end of the spreadsheet, by highlighting everything that I want to pop it in, and then Control v to paste. So I've now created multipliers for uh, our 52.77 year old to any age. So if I wanted a multiplier to age 65, I would find that it's 12.16. I'll put that multiplier to 65 at the top here to show you how life is easier with the additional tables. 265 equals BN59. Now suppose I wanted a multiplier from age 65 for the remainder of the individual's life. Simple. I find my life multiplier and I take off the multiplier to age 65. So the life multiplier, let's go across and find it, 35.98. You'll notice again, like with the 0% tables, it's the same for years uh, in the run up uh, to the end. So 35.98 in box DV59. So here I say equals DV59. And I'm just jotting it on here so that you can see what I'm up to from 65 for life equals DV59 minus, and I can't remember the cell code for the other one, but I've put it in BN2. Uh, so uh, there you have it. Uh, I have created uh, a multiplier from age 65 for life. And you can split any period you want like that. So if over here we say uh, 270, let's scroll down to the, to the yellow line again so we can see uh, what our multiplier to age 70 
uh, was. Tell you what, let's make it 72, and that will mean that we don't clutter up our screen so much. To age 72, it would be equals bu59. Uh, let's say 65 to 72. And that would be equals bu59 minus bn59. You'll see that that's been highlighted there. I'll press return and the formula will go in, which shows us that our multiplier from age 65 to 72 is 6.76. I told you I'd show you how I got the multipliers that I used in the example calculation. So I've opened up the males minus 0.25% spreadsheet. I'm going to scroll down until I find the 50 year old man and highlight that line so you can see what we're talking about. I will just scroll right across to the right so that you can see that the life multiplier is taken from uh, column DV uh, and it's DV56 here. You can see the life multiplier is 36.24. We also need the pension loss multiplier from age 61 uh, and the uh, survivorship multiplier. So I will just go back and show you quickly how to do the pension loss multiplier from age 61. It's super simple. To age 61, uh, we can see that that is cell BJ56. I'll pop that in there as a little old memoir for myself. Uh, the life multiplier we know is cell DV56. So 61 for life is DV56 minus BJ56. Uh, therefore, we have a pension loss multiplier from age 61 of 25.32. I'm not going to show you separately how to calculate the survivorship multiplier. What you do is look up the uh, life multiplier for the survivor in the males table if the survivor is male and the females table if the survivor is female and you simply deduct the claimant's life multiplier from the survivor's life multiplier which gives you your survivorship multiplier. What I do want to illustrate is the uh, splitting uh, vertically as well as horizontally. I've shown you how to do horizontally, but when I was illustrating the effect of actuarial reduction compared to an auto reduction, I imagined a 50-year-old man retiring at 63 years and nine months. I'm going to clear the decks of some of these cells that I don't want cluttered up here so that I can show you uh, how to split vertically. Uh, I blithely told you the pension loss multiplier was 22.64 from age 63 and nine months. Uh, let me show you how to do it. Uh, between age 63 and 64, again, we don't have a column for 63 and nine months, so I will put one in. As my bank blank column, I'm putting in uh, equals 63 and nine months. 63.75, it's calculated for me. I'll go down to the cell that I am actually interested in on this occasion, and it's the same principle as before. We need to go 75% of the way, there's our 75%, from this smaller multiplier towards this greater multiplier. And we simply need to put into this cell a formula to enable us to do that. Here what we're going to do is start from the smaller multiplier, so that's equals BL56. And I'm going to add to BL56 75% of the difference because I want to make my way towards the larger multiplier. So plus the difference between BN56 and BL56, all multiplied by 75%, which gives me the multiplier that I want from age 63.75. I'll just do a quick check to make sure that it's closer to the multiplier for 64, which it should be, and it is so I know that the formula has worked. What we've just calculated there is a multiplier for a 50 year old man to age 63.75, but that's not what we need. We want the multiplier from 63.75 for life. So I will just jot down a note of the cell reference. Uh, that is cell BM56 is our multiplier through to age 63.75. And if I go across to the life uh, multiplier, here it is in cell D. Uh, w uh, at 36.24. So life uh, DW 
was cell BM56. Uh, and 63.75 for life. Oops, I didn't remember the equal sign there, equals DW56. Equals, well, it's DW56, I can remember from uh, when I did it a moment ago, minus BM56, or you could have just used the two cell. Uh, totals that you have above there. I'm trying to show you the calculation. So I get for uh, the period from 63.75 for life a multiplier of 22.64 which is why I used that figure in the example that I gave you earlier on. There's no use kidding yourself that all of this is easy. There's a lot to master. Multipliers, accrual rates, actuarial reduction factors and enhancement factors. I need to bring in the loss components from different pension schemes because many claimants have moved from one to another. And on that score, I can warn you that because transitional provisions were judged to unlawfully discriminate in the case of McLeod, there's potential for some public servants who were made to transition to a career average scheme to in fact require their loss to be calculated as though they were in a final salary scheme. You've got the long term deduction from lost lump sum where you only give credit for that part commuted from the period after pension age but for the accident. You have to think about tax. It feels like a nightmare, but it isn't. You need to understand the principles, then be methodical in working through the calculations. Do that and you're there. Thank you for watching.